Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, welcome to Preventing Recalls in the Medical Device Industry. I am one of your hosts, Patrick Londa, and I am joined by John Fortunati as well. Hi everybody, my name's John, I'm the Sales Engineer for Collaborator. And uh, I am the Marketing Manager for Collaborator as well. Um, and we're both from SmartBear Software, so we figured we'd, we'd kick off by telling you a little bit about SmartBear Software, if, if you're not familiar. Um, so SmartBear Software, we focus on providing software quality tools for teams, and specifically our goal is to infuse quality and speed into your entire software development lifecycle. Um, so I'm not going to get into all the details, but we do want to share the breadth of the SmartBear product portfolio, covering the entire development lifecycle from development to testing to operations across both the API and UI layers. Our products enable teams to deliver the best possible software faster than ever. And we'll get into our code and document review tool collaborator a little bit later. Today, we'll start off with a big picture overview of the state of the industry, look at a few key trends, and then we'll outline the steps that a team can take to focus on quality early on. Then we'll show how our code and document review tool collaborator is helping leading companies in the industry achieve compliance and reduce software defects. So just to set the stage, we're going to start by looking at the medical device industry as a whole and look at some of the key trends. Overall, the medical device industry is a $328 billion industry as of 2017 and has grown since 2016 at a rate of 10% year over year. So it's growing at a rate more similar to the technology sector, which has been growing at roughly 11% uh, compared to the healthcare sector, which is growing more at 6% year over year. Additionally, one other thing uh, that's an interesting indicator of a much larger trend um, is that there's a 38% uh, growth projection for in-home healthcare jobs. So healthcare is moving more and more from the hospital to the home, and part of that trend is due to the availability of new types of medical devices. So the very definition of a medical device is expanding as companies like Amazon, Apple, and Fitbit start moving into the health tracking and management field. For example, now you can track your diabetes with an app from Amata Health on your iPad. You can send information from your Fitbit to that app and then have your Alexa in the kitchen make food recommendations, taking into account your latest health data. This started with personal fitness apps like RunKeeper, but has shifted to accommodate new solutions that are tailored to specific healthcare needs. Additionally, pharmaceutical companies are now beginning to use apps to go beyond clinical trials and track real-world results and symptoms. This digital health space is definitely an area to watch. The more connected medical devices can be with these mHealth applications, the more data that will be available for physicians to make decisions. But as the industry shifts, uh, there are certainly things to be concerned about. One of the most important issues is the recent jump in recalls and class one recalls specifically, which are the highest risk recall class. As the medical device industry grows quickly, it has to find a way to maintain and improve quality, meet compliance burdens, and keep up with the new digital solutions entering the market. The number of total recalls in, in 2003 was 604, and that steadily rose until it had doubled by 2012. This chart doesn't show a great year over year trend since it's broken out by quarter, but you can get a sense of the scale of the recall problem. In Q2 of 2017, there were about 67.3 million units recalled. So what caused these recalls? The majority of units were recalled due to sterility issues, um, and these are typically the kinds of units that don't have software as a component. For the rest of this webinar, we're mostly going to focus on the recalls that were triggered by quality issues and software issues. While software was the primary issue for only 1.9% of the recalls, that, that translates to roughly 1.3 million units. And that number is likely to rise because there's now an example of software vulnerabilities in medical devices being seen as a financial opportunity. In 2016, Money Waters Capital hired MedSec, which is a cybersecurity penetration tester, to analyze a pacemaker produced by St. Jude Medical with the intention of finding a flaw, publishing that flaw, and winning a payout by shorting the manufacturer's stock. The net result has been lawsuits, countersuits, and the FDA responded to understandable public pressure with a recall of 465,000 pacemakers in the US. Unlike recalling a blender or, or another appliance, it's not as simple as mailing it back. Everyone affected by this recall needs to make an appointment so that their doctor can update the device's firmware. 
so this is an example of a new kind of recall, um, and one, one that's especially expensive. After this unauthorized test by MedSec publicized a major hacking vulnerability, Whitescope, a California-based security firm, conducted a study on devices from four pacemaker manufacturers. That study identified 8,000 bugs or hacking vulnerabilities rooted in unencrypted patient information and software systems that hadn't been updated sufficiently. If you remember back in 2016, there was a DDoS attack that was able to take down sites like Netflix, Twitter, and Spotify. It was able to gain such traction by leveraging the weak cybersecurity protections in these connected devices. As the trend towards digital health demands data interoperability, med device companies will need to invest in cybersecurity in order to protect the data from attacks while also being able to share it with other devices and apps. The medical device industry has a lot of compliance burdens associated with it. In addition to quality management standards like ISO 13485 and ISO 9001, we often hear from customers that their development teams have to comply with the FDA's 21 CFR Part 11. This code lays out requirements around validation, audit trails, record, records retention. Essentially, this code aligns digital processes with the other quality management standards. Compliance burdens are a necessary component of highly regulated industries like this one, but they do often drag down the overall development process because of their audits and manual documentation. So let's take a look at some steps that your team can take to build quality into the development process early. First off, quality can mean a lot of different things. For healthcare, a lot of product development comes down to asking the right questions early on. By bringing people and especially potential users into the product development process, you can achieve a design that yields an intuitive user experience and therefore a better device. That's why the end user is at the center of our product development lifecycle. The fail fast, fail often mentality is something that uh, people often associate with agile development, where you run many iterations and you generate a minimally viable prototype allowing for more testing time, more user testing, um, and you can bring on new features only after you've got the initial functionality working. Actually, adopting Agile isn't always the answer. For some companies, they're just not configured in, in a way to easily make that transition. Um, but some of the frameworks are useful no matter what framework your team is using. So individual accountability and regular collaboration, for example, are the pillars of most successful teams. In manufacturing right now, there's a lot of talk around the concept of a digital thread. Basically, a digital thread is a complete record of the communications and development processes that produce each part. When you create this thread, audit trails become a lot more comprehensive and easier to follow, defects become easier to remedy, and process improvements get a lot more data-driven. The testing team, for example, should be able to easily have visibility into any conversations around software requirements, design documents, code reviews, and test cases. The benefit of cross-functional teams is that they allow you to iterate quickly. A lack of communication and transparency handcuffs those team members to whatever silo they typically function in. So we've established that teams focused on quality are iterating quickly and collaborating regularly. By opening up information on the development process, these teams are able to increase visibility and break down their functional silos. These two steps alone will set a team in the right direction. But how fast and far can a team go with a clunky workflow and insufficient tools? Bringing the right tools on board can unlock a better workflow that wouldn't have been possible before. This list of criteria can function as a rubric for evaluating new tools. Will your team need to adapt to fit the tools requirements, or can the tool adapt to fit your team's specific needs? So now we're going to talk a little bit about Collaborator and how it's been helping leading companies in the industry focus on quality through robust peer reviews across their product development lifecycle. And for that, I'm going to transfer it over to John. And he's, he's going to present a case study on how a dev manager might use Collaborator. Cool. Thanks, Pat. All right. So as Pat mentioned, what we're going to look at is how a team could use a tool like Collaborator to make sure and ensure that the product that they're delivering to their market is high quality, especially when their product has a low margin of error and is, is going to be selling in a highly regulated industry. Um, so again, as Pat mentioned, we're going to take the scenario of a dev manager who's primary concern for his or her dev team is to make sure that they're producing high quality code free of defects or as defect free as one could hope to be in the development process, high quality designs for their product, have a high quality process, as well as make sure that they have the ability to provide an audit trail and some documentation on everything that they're doing. 
So what we're looking at right now on my screen is the Collaborator Web UI. And we can see here that our Dev Manager has a number of action items signified by these different reviews that we have over here that he's going to work through, again, to go through those four different themes that we just, just talked about. So let's start with the code review. What I'm pulling up now is the diff viewer. And the diff viewer is going to show us our file, our code file that we're looking at. And it's going to show us the difference between the current revision of our code and the prior revision of our code, or any specific diff that we choose. Here we're seeing we're highlighting in green what's been added. We'd also be highlighting what's changed or removed in red or yellow, sorry, yellow or red respectively. On the left over here, we have our chat panel. And this is what our dev manager is going to be really interested in because here's where he's going to see all the questions, conversations, comments, and defects associated with this review. And the nice thing is that these comments and defects are going to be tied to individual lines of code. So this is where we're going to start seeing that theme of traceability already in the code review. We can tell why a line of code was added, who commented on that line of code, what kind of questions and conversations were added, useful for a regulatory sense, but also useful if in the future you need to look back and understand why you were making the changes you were making maybe one, two, even three years ago. Um, in addition to that, we're going to be able to tie defects to individual lines of code. Again, all the same benefits of tying a comment to an individual line of code, but when we add those defects, we'll also be able to append things like a severity or a type of defect to them, or really using our custom fields that are built into our templates, which um, we'll talk about maybe a little bit later any kind of information that we may deem useful for future kind of quantitative analysis about our defects. Identifying defect trends, where are we seeing defects more often than not, what kind of defects are we seeing more frequently, things like that. So back to our dev manager. He may catch up on some of the conversations that are going over here, but I think the big thing he's going to want to do is mark this bug as fixed and then hop out of this review. So let's go back to our home screen. And the next thing our dev manager is going to want to do after looking at the quality of his code is look at the quality of his design or his product in general. And he's going to do that by going into the document review. We're going to open up a diff viewer for a doc just like we would for a code file. Collaborator supports documents of PDFs, Word, Excel, image files, and soon to be supporting PowerPoint files as well. And through supporting all these different types of files, we can bring things into our product, or into Collaborator, rather, like test plans, requirements documents, which we have up right here. Uh, we even have some customers who are bringing in things like circuit diagrams and analyze using the peer review process on their circuit board layouts or models from something like Simulink or MATLAB, rather. So I'm really powerful with what you can apply this peer review process to. But in this case, what the dev manager is looking for is who's been working on this requirements document, who's asking questions about which requirements need to be there. Maybe we're pulling in a tester who's asking, hey, how can I test this for this requirement? Maybe we're pulling in a product manager who's saying, based on what I learned from the dev team, we don't need this requirement anymore or I have to change this requirement. Um, but we're going to have the ability to pull the right people in and ensure, again, that our design is getting the appropriate attention and level of a detail that our code reviews are getting as well. So here our dev manager is probably just going to look around, make sure that the code that we just looked at is being tied to our requirements document. If anyone's actually reading the document, you'll probably notice that uh, it's not really too helpful, but he'll be happy there and go back to his home page. All right, so he's happy with his code. He's happy with his document review. The next thing that our dev manager is going to want to do, especially in these regulated industries, is ensure that he has a process that's going to help him assure accountability, traceability, things like that. So he's going to open up this untitled review here. Um, and what, he's, what his role for this review will be is just to approve it. He's a dev manager, so he just needs to give the final sign-off um, and give his seal of approval. And the first level of doing that is going to be how all the reviewers will be able to give their sign-up approval, which is simply just approving the review. 
but the next level of approval will be with the electronic signature. And we can see that at the bottom of the screen right now, and I'll highlight that so it's a little bit more visible. But with the second layer of approval, we can now ensure that someone is looking out, did we have all the right people who were supposed to be on the review from all the correct disciplines? Did we get the proper sign-offs? Did we look at all the right files? Did we perform the checklist items that we were supposed to check? Did we use those custom checklists? Again, alluding to those custom templates, which we'll talk about later. But really making sure everything that was supposed to happen with this review did in fact happen with this review. So our dev manager in this case is happy with this review. So he'll sign that. And after providing his credentials to prove he is who he says he is, we'll have this review as fully completed. And again, now we have that audit trail from the start of development all the way to the signature, keeping track of everyone that was there, including who signed off on that, and keeping that record for our own internal use, but also for external auditors or uh, compliance. This e-signature feature is especially important if, if you're looking to comply with CFR Part 11, uh, which is mostly around keeping those audit trails, um, records retention, and has a specific uh, mention of e-signatures as being part of that process. All right, so the last thing our dev manager is going to want to do is provide some reporting on his process. So I'm going to pull up something called a detailed review report, and this is a report on a specific review. And what our dev manager here is looking to do is to save this review in a format which you can easily distribute in the future. So if someone were to come in and say, provide proof of the fact that you did code reviews, he can easily do that for his team without having to distract them. Likewise, if in the future he wants to share these reviews with someone else, maybe within the company, uh, he'll be able to do that through PDFs and through these, I'm sorry, through these reports, which can be saved as PDFs. And what we're looking at here is all the different metrics that we're saving during a review from very code specific things like how many lines of code were changed, what was the inspection rate in lines of code per hour, how many defects did we find in thousand lines of code or per every thousand line of code to less code specific things like the number of defects we found in general. Checklist items, who checked them off, a record of that, who participated in the review, even down to all the individual comments that were added to the review, who added them, which revision of the specific files they were added to, all of that information tracked again for that traceability um, and for that compliance use case. All right, so that was a very quick overview of, again, a day in the life of the dev manager, looking at some of the things that may want, they may want to use a tool like Collaborator for building a product in a regulated industry with those tight margins of error. Um, so I'll pass the ball back to Pat. Great. Uh, thank, thank you, John. Um, so now we're going to open it up for questions. Um, if, if anyone has questions, feel free to type them into the GoToWebinar chat box, um, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, and while, while we wait for people to put in questions, I will just mention that um, you know, feel, feel free to reach out for a personalized demo. Um, we're, we're more than happy to show off the full, full capabilities of, of Collaborator in a 30-minute demo uh, for you and your team. Um, and then additionally, we do offer a free trial for 30 days. So you can go in, see, see how Collaborator would work for your team, um, and if, if it's going to ultimately be a good fit. All right, so we do have a question that just came in. Um, it said, you mentioned custom templates. Uh, can you show them, basically? Yeah, definitely. So I'm just going to create a new review. So custom templates are going to drive our workflow for our team. The templates are completely customizable, so that allows you to completely customize your workflow. Different teams can have different workflows. Uh, which can be really beneficial in a diverse development environment. But right now I have the default template selected. So what I'm going to do is select uh, this source job. And just a note on all these templates here, there's nothing in particular about these templates. They're not shipped with Collaborator. I created all these templates. Um, I was asked before, do you only have a Java template? Well, that's the only one that I made. But of course, within your organization, you can make as many templates as you need for however you wish to use them. 
But when I changed that template, you'll notice a few things came, or popped up rather, some custom fields popped up, as well as a custom checklist. And again, the text for all these is completely customizable. There's nothing inherent about these fields or checklist collaborator. I created them myself, uh, just like you'll be able to very easily using our templates and using our custom field creators. And in the background, which you can't see, but some rules around participants, minimum number of required participants, what types of roles are required for this review, who has the power to sign off on the review, whether or not we need that final e-signature. Um, and again, these custom templates are really going to drive that workflow through throughout the product. And we'll see them again in things like reports. We'll be able to report on these custom templates and then further customize our reports, as well as I alluded to that in our defects. We'll be able to see our defects have these custom fields so we can grab specific data that we're interested in for the bugs that we're looking at. Did I answer the question? Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, and, and this also kind of gets gets to, you know, when you're selecting your tools, uh, is, is a new tool going to be something that your team is going to have to adapt to, or can your tool uh, adapt to the needs of your team? And that's something that we take into account when we're developing collaborators, that we want to make it very flexible, very very customizable to whatever workflow fits your team best. All right, and it looks like we have, we have one more question um, that's asking about a little, just to explain a little bit more about the reporting. Yeah, definitely. So I'm just going to pull up the reporting tab. All right, I've realized there are a lot of words here, um, but these are all the different reports that Collaborator comes with natively. So the entire time we're performing all these reviews, we're storing all sorts of data from metrics, like I mentioned before, like how many lines of code per hour we're reviewing, so speed metrics to things like those custom fields. We're keeping track of those as well, and those are all living in our database. So we have a number of reports that will help us pull that data and give us different vantage points to our process. Uh, the one we looked at earlier was this detailed report that we see over here, but we also have reports that will show you aggregate reports on all the reviews in your system. For example, this recently completed reviews report, which I can customize to show me all the reports with more, I'm sorry, all the reviews with more than two files uh, over the last month. And then you can pull, do custom reporting data from that, as well as, if I'm interested, in all the defects in my system. Show me all the defects of this type or of this severity or of this particular custom field I'm tracking. And we can use these to start to get that quantitative analysis on our process versus the qualitative analysis, the I know this will happen versus the I feel this will happen. Perfect. All right, well, it looks like uh, we, we are just about out of time. Um, so I do want to thank everyone for joining. Um, I, hope, I hope this webinar has given you and your team some ideas around uh, how to focus on quality moving forward across your product development lifecycle. Um, and again, just want to thank you for joining and uh, hope, hope you all have a great day. All right, thanks.